Hello, I'm Adam Chapala, Program Chair of ICFP 2020. and It's my pleasure to kick off our first session of contributed talks. We're making these available to the public on YouTube. So for those of you who've registered for the conference, you also have access to an additional service called Clouder, which gives you a more interactive experience. So if you're registered, but you're not in Clouder right now, please head over there and look for current and upcoming talk titles highlighted on the screen. For instance, right now you should see Stable Relations and Abstract Interpretation for Higher Order Programs, the very next talk. So you can click a talk title like that one and get the full interactive experience, including text chat during the talk and a video Q&A with the authors afterward. Actually, you might find the authors participating alongside you in both of those because they've pre-recorded their talk videos so they can join the text chat. Not all authors are joining the, the video Q&A in both the New York and Asia time bands that we're offering. So check Clouder for links to Q&A sessions that are happening. If you don't see the one you're interested in for a talk that's, that's playing now, then probably the authors are in the other time band instead. All right, so I'll remind you of some of these details as we progress through the session. First up, we're going to have Bunuel Montague telling us about abstract interpretation for higher order programs. Hello, my name is Benoit Montagu, and I'm going to tell you about a joint work with Thomas Jensen about the abstract interpretation of higher order programs. The problem we're interested in is the inference of program frames. This means that we want to detect what a function call does not change. For imperative programs, uh, it amounts to finding which parts of the global state are not modified by a function call. For functional programs, uh, it amounts to finding which parts of the input and the output are the same. This frame information can be used, for example, in optimizing compilers to perform common sub-expression elimination across function calls. The same information can also be exploited in program verification and, in particular, invariant preservation proofs. The properties of the parts of the, of the state that have not changed are indeed automatically preserved. Last year, we published a paper on what we call a correlation analysis. It's a static analysis that infers frames for first-order programs. We applied it to the verification of an OS microkernel and it was able to prove automatically 68% of the invariant preservation lemmas. That means that inferring frames is really useful in practice. In this work, we want to extend the correlation analysis to infer frames for a higher order language. Our long-term goal is to integrate such an analysis in a general purpose proof assistant to make the verification of large programs easier. To infer frames for the lambda calculus, we followed the methodology that is offered by the abstract interpretation framework. The first step is to clearly define what property you're interested in. In this work, we want to find relations between the inputs and the outputs of a lambda term. The second step of the methodology is to define a collecting semantics for your property. It describes how your property evolves when your program gets evaluated. In this work, the collecting semantics takes the form of a denotation of a lambda term into input-output relations. We have proved that this denotation is sound and complete, and as a bonus, uh, you will find in the paper an equivalent definition in the form of a program logic. The third and final step of the abstract interpretation methodology is to apply successive abstractions on the collecting semantics. By doing so, you obtain an analysis with which you can effectively compute. In this work, we have used two abstractions. The first one is a variance of a well-known independent attribute abstraction. And the second one introduces the correlation domain we presented last year that we extended to support first-class functions. What we get in the end is a simple modular analysis that is already quite expressive. And we have mechanically verified all these results in the Cockproof assistant. The language we study in the paper is the n-typed call-by-value lambda calculus extended with pairs and binary sums. The definition of values in this language is the standard one. And we use the standard small step semantics for call-by-value that performs a substitution to, to reduce a beta redex. For this, for this higher order language, we want to infer relations between the inputs of programs and their outputs. But what are the inputs? We 
consider that the inputs of a program are the possible substitutions sigma that assign values to the free variables of that program. Then the input-output relation of a term t for a set of inputs i is the set of pairs made from substitutions drawn from the set of inputs and the values that are obtained from evaluating the term t sigma, that is t where all its three variables have been replaced with the values defined by the substitution sigma. With the semantics of input-output relations, we can, for instance, state that a term t always returns zero when the input x is assigned to a negative value, or that t returns a value that remains above the value of the input x. Now, we remark that if sigma defines all the inputs of a program t, then you can use any substitution sigma prime that defines more inputs, even some inputs that are not necessary to t, without changing the meaning of the program t. In such a case, we say that sigma prime extends sigma. And because specifying values for more inputs than necessary does not change the meaning of a program, we can actually close the set of inputs i under the extension ordering of substitutions. And by doing so, the input-output relation of a term becomes what we call a stable relation. A relation is stable when if an input substitution sigma related to some out, is related to some output v, then any substitution that is more defined than sigma must also be related to the same value v. This definition should not surprise the logicians among you. Uh, what we call stability is similar to the notion of persistence that is found in Kripke-style semantics. That is to say, if a property holds in some world, it, will, it must also hold in any larger world. And that definition should be no surprise to the semanticists among you either, because a stable relation is in fact a monotone function from substitutions ordered with the extension ordering to sets of values ordered with set inclusion. So we have defined in the paper a denotation that given a term t and an environment builds a stable relation uh, between the inputs and the outputs of t. The environment denotes a set of admissible inputs, and as expected in denotational semantics, the denotation function is defined in a compositional way by induction over the syntax of the program. For example, the denotation of a program that builds a pair out of two subprograms T1 and T2 is the pairing of their denotations. Here, the pairing of relations relates an input sigma to a pair of values where the first component of that value is related to the input using the denotation of t1, and the second component of the value is related to the same input using the denotation of t2. We have proved that this denotation is sound with respect to the input-output, in the sense that it is an over-approximation of the input-output relation. This means that if you take an input substitution sigma in the set of valid inputs described by the environment, and if the evaluation of the program T with these inputs gives you an output value V, then the input-output pair sigma V is predictably in the denotation of the program. Interestingly, the denotation we have defined is also complete. This means that the, denot the denotation of the input-output relation are the same. We have mechanically verified these results in the Cock proof assistant. Our denotation must treat variables very carefully, and here is why. Uh, you should expect that the denotation of a variable is just a lookup for that variable in the environment. This is indeed a correct over-approximation. But in the paper, we give a sound and complete definition. Here it is. I will not explain all the details, but just notice that the definition uses a relation self of x. This relation states that the output must be exactly what was given as input for the variable x. In particular, this means that the denotation of the variable x is a relation in which the variable x occurs. In other words, the denotation of a term may involve the names of its inputs. This means that the semantic denotations can refer to syntactic variables. This has consequences on the well-formedness of the definition. 
you need to show, for example, that the three variables of your denotations are included in the variables that are defined by the environment. But what does it even mean to be a free variable for a relation? Relations are semantic objects, not pieces of syntax. And to answer this question, we use nominal techniques to carefully handle names. If you want to dive into the details, please have a look at the paper. Now, how do we handle functions? Uh, let's start with function application. The denotation of T1 applied to T2 is the app of, the, uh, of their denotations. This is a relation where when you take values in the, in the denotations of T1 and T2 and apply them together, you must obtain a term that evaluates to a value V. And this result value V must be the value in the final denotation. That's it for applications. Now for functions, I won't have time to show you the full definition of the denotation, but you should remember that it can be over approximated by your relation that, assuming some condition R on the argument, gives you the denotation of the function's body. Here is the unfolded definition, where I have chosen to hide some pieces related to name management. Let's go through it. This is a relation where the output is supposed to be a function, for which we will consider all possible applications. When we apply this function to an argument v1 that satisfies the condition r, if the evaluation gives a result v2, then v2 must be in the denotation of the function body. But the argument and result must be valid for all possible extensions of the input substitutions, as is usually found in Kripke style semantics. And this is essential because this quantification of our extensions of the inputs is the reason that makes the definition a stable relation. In the end, we have a modular denotation rule for functions that we later use as a basis for the modular analysis of functions. So we have defined this denotation, this collecting semantics that describes exactly the input output behavior of programs. And we used it as a starting point to build a static analysis so, following the abstract interpretation, interpretation methodology, we applied successive abstraction steps. Our, so far, our denotation tells us how the inputs are related to the outputs globally. We first apply a variant of the independent attribute abstraction. We obtain at this point what we call pointwise relations that, that tell us how each input is independently related to the output. For each input x, you we obtain a binary relation on values that says how sigma of x is related to the output v. Then we abstract these binary relations on values into an abstract domain that we call correlations and with which we can effectively compute. This abstract domain is an extension of the correlation abstract domain from our previous work that we extended with first class functions. You will find plenty of details on how we did this in the paper. We implemented the resulting analysis in OCaml. This is a bottom-up modular analyzer that analyzes functions only once. For every function, it computes a function summary that approximates the extensional behavior of that function. The analysis was really not designed to compete with existing control flow, existing control flow analysis. And it does not compete. Still, it can give very precise results, even though it follows a fully modular approach. Let's consider this classic CFA example. This program calls the identity function twice on two different arg arguments and returns the result of one of the calls. It's an example where zero CFA is not precise enough and one CFA is required to achieve good precision. The analyzer first computes a summary for the identity function. The summary tells us that this is a function whose result is equal to its argument, whatever is the calling context. This summary is instantiated once for the first application. We get that y1 must be bound uh, to the first injection. Then it's, uh, the summary is in instantiated a second time for the second application. And uh, the analysis tells us that y2 must be bound to the second injection. Finally, the analysis for the result is the domain we have obtained for y1. That is to say, it has to be the first injection. On this example, we can see that the analysis gives the most precise results. 
and this is on par with one CFA. To wrap up, we have defined solid foundations for the relational analysis of higher order programs by means of a sound and complete relational semantics for the lambda calculus. We exploited this collecting semantics to design an effective analysis and we provide an, abst an, an artifact sorry, for the cock formalization of the theoretical development. As a long-term goal, we would like to integrate such an analysis with a proof assistant to reduce the proof effort for the verif verification of large programs. On the shorter term, we want to support more language features and to increase the, the precision of the analysis, for example, by, exploit by exploiting numeric abstract domains. Finally, we are convinced that our denotation semantics can serve as a basis for the future design of novel relational control flow analysis that's all. Thank you for watching. Thanks, Bonwa. If you're watching in the New York Time Band, you should now see a link appear in Clouder to join a video chat where you can ask Bonwa your questions. Unfortunately, he's not available in the Asia Time Band. Okay, let's get started with the next talk. We have Scott Smith on symbolic evaluation of functional languages. Welcome to our talk on a higher order demand driven symbolic evaluation. Let's parse this title a bit, particularly what is meant by demand driven. Demand driven means goal directed. So rather than working forward, we're gonna start with a goal and work backward. And this is well known from logic programming and tactic based provers where it's clear what your goal is and so it's best to start from that goal and work backward rather than trying to forward chain, although sometimes forward chaining is good. Generally, you're shooting in the dark a lot of times and you're very far away from your target. So goal directed is clearly a win there and it's the common approach. Now, if we look at program analyses, symbolic executors and interpreters, it's more the opposite. That tends to be, you don't have a fixed narrow goal in the, in the space. It tends to be you wanna run the whole program in all of these cases, and so they tend to be forward. But there are some cases when demand is useful if you have a particular part of the program you want to get a very accurate result on, a um, demand program analysis could be effective, and you don't have to go through all the work on the whole program. And so reps and collaborators wrote a series of influential papers doing this in the imperative language space, and there have been a few efforts in the functional space. One is DDPA, which is our work, so there have been some functional demand program analyses, and in the symbolic execution space, Snugglebug is an imperative demand symbolic executor, and this paper is basically about filling in this box with DDSE, which is our functional demand symbolic executor. And to do a functional demand symbolic executor, we need an interpreter, which is demand, in which we're going to symbolize. And so we're also going to present DDI, which is a new notion of functional interpreter. And it is novel and it has no substitution environment or closures because you can't, these data structures are built in the forward direction and we're not running forward. And so the interpreter itself is pretty interesting. And so the outline of the talk is we're going to briefly talk about the language syntax. Then we're going to do this novel interpreter and then we're going to show how it can be generalized to a symbolic evaluator. And then we're going to look at our implementation very briefly. So the syntax we have is pretty standard, very simple functional language in our theory. And we're going to have input because um, the, the way we're going to test our symbolic evaluators, we're going to find um, inputs that reach a particular line of the program. That's sort of our concrete goal to show that the method works. And recursion is encoded via self-passing. And the implementation also has additional features such as recursive data structures. And the syntax we use is a normal form. And this is an example. And you can see in a normal form, every operator, the components are all atomic. And this exposes the order, which is very useful because we're going to be running programs backwards. So reading right to left. And it's very handy to know the order more explicitly. And also variable names are unique. So here we have x, y, and ret. And those serve as the program points because they're unique. So there's that we'll use that to name points in a program. 
So the main function we want to find is a lookup function. And the lookup function, we want to find the value of a variable. So that's the variable we, we want to look up. That's the point at which we want to start in the program to look it up. And this one parameter we'll talk more about is the call stack, which we use to disambiguate different activations. And the final result is a V. <clears throat> so yeah, so this is the program point call stack. And this, in general, this is going to be a list, but for now we're just covering the case where it's a singleton. And the idea is we're just going to walk back through the program to find the variable is the intuition. So here the variable y, if we're actually at its definition, it's, it's um, axiomatic that the value is 1. But if we're down here at this line, f1, so these don't remember the line we're looking up from the program point. So <clears throat> to find y, this y, we basically can search back up through it and we'll find it up here. And more interesting, if we're in, for example, this variable x here, the only way we're going to reach that is via a call from one of these call sites. And here, this disambiguates which call we took. So we are in the call F1 is how we got there. And we are pretty clear if we're looking up X from the call F1, X is the argument passed in as Y, and then we can look up Y and in turn get 1. So 1 is the result of that. So let's go through the, in detail how we trace that call, so a little more about how the actual lookup function works. And so to look up f1, at this point, we know that it's the return result of the function f. So it suffices to look up the return variable fret in that code, at the last line of code, which is fret. So we're looking up from the point that we're pointing to, and we're looking up that variable. And the value is immediately there, just right in front of us. And by the way, we have pushed a call frame because we're in this call. So f1 names the, the call frame that we're in on the call stack. And so it suffices for fret, clearly it's x plus 1. So all you get is look up x and add 1 to it, and we have our results. So we're going to look up x. That's the underlying lookup. So we're looking up x um, from the top of the function. At this point, now it's pretty clear that since we came in via the call f1, we know that we came in this call here, and the parameter y is what gets passed to x. So to look up x, it suffices to look up y from the top of the program, the empty stack. And that pretty clearly is going to be 1. And then the final result is 1 plus 1, which is 2. So that's a simple uh, lookup. And a little more complicated case is if you have non-local variables. And here's a simple example of a curried addition function. And let's start in the middle of this lookup. So we want to look up the value of x. And this is the tricky case because it's a non-local variable. It's defined all the way out here. And the way we got there, the way we're actually going to run this code, if you look at the program, it's going to be from this call site here. Because first we supply 5 for x and then 1 for y, and then we're going to um, do this call, in which case we'll run this code. Um, so that means that we had to have come in via this uh, call site, uh, ret call site here. So this is an example of where we um, could have gotten to um, in a lookup from the end of the program, for example. And so we're at that line here, gyret, its definition. We want to find the value of x. So what do we do? Well, um, x is not in scope. But the principle of lexical scoping is the function we are running, i.e., this function here, gret, we know that the x variable must have been in scope when that function was defined. As you can see, it's in scope at the function definition point. And so what we do is we know that that function is the value of g5, because that's the function we call. This is the call site we came from, ret, and that function g5 was called. So the, what we do is we write a lookup like this, which means let's first look for the function definition where g5's code is, and then pop that off and resume a lookup for x. And we should find it at that point. So let's do that. <clears throat> so to find g5, in fact, is the return result of this call. So we want to pop into g's body and look for gret, which will be the value of g5. So to look up g5, it suffices to look up gret from within this call at this line. So let's do that. And to find to find gret, um, well, it's right there. We found it. It's the last line of the code. So all we have to do now is to pop this frame off the stack and 
um, resume looking up for x, and look, we win. x is within scope now. So in fact, it should be very easy to find the value of x. It, in fact, is the parameter at the call site g5, which in fact is 5. So that's the answer. And so in general, the lookup, if we have higher and higher order functions, this list can grow longer and longer. Um, but, um, but this is the full general signature of our lookup. So it has two lists of variables, basically, and that's all of the data structure of this interpreter. And here are the <clears throat> full rules. You can see there's, it's a lot more complicated than the pure lambda calculus. Um, so there are a lot of subtleties here, but it does fit on a slide, so it's not hopelessly complex. So let's now look at how we make a symbolic version of this. So it's a very similar parameters, and instead of returning a value, we return a variable, which and then in the constraints, we also have a constraint set, and the idea is we're going to constrain that variable to have some properties, <clears throat> which we can then use an SMT solver to find an actual solution for. And so yeah, so this S here means a symbolic version of lookup. So let's run that on the same example, the same lookup of F1's value. So we go into Fret and look up Fret's value, and we can immediately see it's right there. It's x plus 1. So we're actually, this time we're going to return a variable. And remember, the variables are indexed by the call stack. So this variable is indexed by F1 in this case, because that's how we came into this function. <clears throat> so that's, in fact, the result of the lookup. So we're done the result of looking up. <clears throat> but additionally, we have a constraint which requires this variable to have the value of whatever x's lookup is plus 1. And remember, this lookup here is in turn going to return a variable. So let's proceed with that lookup and see what it returns. So to look up x from this point here, it suffices to uh, look up the parameter of the call site. The call site was f1, so the parameter is y. So it suffices to look up y. And if we, see, if we go up, we see y is up at the top of the program. It's, in fact, an input. So this is, by the way, use of the input syntax. And inputs are unconstrained because there's they could be arbitrary. And so in the symbolic execution, we just return the variable with no added constraints. So that means that the final constraint set <clears throat> is that this fret equals this lookup here, which returned just the value y in the empty stack plus 1. So we get that. That's the only constraint on this very simple example. And it's clear there are many satisfiable solutions to it. So that's an example of a symbolic execution. <clears throat> so in the paper, we make a formal operational semantics for all these systems. And the main result we prove, or the most uh, difficult result, is that a backward running demand operational semantics, this lookup operation, is in fact isomorphic to a forward running operational semantics. And it's a delicate proof because they're running in opposite directions. And we also prove that the symbolic evaluator is sound and complete with respect to the operational semantics. And a few subtle details that we have to skip because of time is that the call stack, when we're starting in the middle, we really want to start in the middle because that's what demand lookup means. We want to start from any point. And you might not, you, you will have no idea of the call stack when you start that run. And we meet, need to incrementally infer what the call stack is as we go. And also input will not come in the forward order when we're doing a reverse lookup and we need to basically do a sorting operation on the input. And that's all in the paper. So for our implementation, the Artifact we produce is a test generator. So given a program and a target line, we will find inputs which reach that target line of code. And we have an initial proof of concept implementation in OCaml. And in order to make it uh, usable at all, we have to dovetail on all the different search paths or we get lost down some infinite path. And so we use a coroutine non-determinism monad for that purpose. And just to test it out a little bit, there is a paper that has a forward symbolic evaluator in it, and we basically solve the benchmarks from that paper um, to sort of as a test to make sure our system is reasonable. And to compare very briefly with related work, so Snugglebug is an imperative demand symbolic executor. The Kron's work that we just mentioned is a forward functional symbolic executor. And it also has restrictions. For example, all functions have to be total, um, which we don't have in our system. And Rosette is another forward symbolic execution framework. And it has some restrictions on data types not being arbitrarily 
sized. And our work has, it's, it's the first that we know of demand functional symbolic evaluator, and it has no restrictions on data types or recursion, and we've proven it sound and complete. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. In either time band, you should see a link appearing in Clouder to join a live Q&A session with at least one of the authors. All right, next up is Kazutaka Matsuda on a language for partially invertible computations. Hello, I'm Kazutaka Matsuda from Tohoku University. Today, I'd like to introduce our new programming language, Sparkle, which is a language for partially invertible computation. Sparkle is named after a system for partially reversible computation with linear types. Let us start with the background, invertible programming. Invertibility is a common and important concept in software development. For example, we have compression and decompression, we have undoing and redoing, we have serialization and deserialization. Invertible programming is a way to provide correctness by construction. Then, natural question arises. For normal programming, the basic building blocks are functions. But for invertible programming, what should be the building blocks? An obvious approach is to use invertible function for invertible programming. However, this approach is restrictive because invertible functions have to be injective. But it is known that some functions become invertible after fixing some argument. These functions are called partially invertible functions. An example of a partially invertible function is an addition, which becomes invertible after fixing either of the arguments. A more practical example of a partially invertible function is Huffman encoding, which becomes invertible after fixing Huffman encoding table. And then, a question is, is it possible to do invertible programming through partially invertible programming? If so, what is a language for partially invertible programming? This paper answer to this question. We've designed a Sparkle, which is a programming language for writing invertible functions through composing partially invertible functions. This is because partially invertible functions are more natural and more expressive. Sparkle uses linear types, which is a key to correctness by construction. Let us start with an example to explain the problem and solution in more detail. Consider a function that computes difference of adjacent element in a list. Starting from zero, this function repeatedly computes the difference from a previous element. For example, the difference between one and zero is one, so it output one, and the difference between two and one is one, so it output one, the difference between five and two is three, so it outputs three, and so on. This is a very simple function, but indeed useful. Actually, a variant of this function can be used as a preprocessing for image compression as found in PING. The standard unidirectional implementation of this transformation looks like this. The subs take a list of int and return the list of int. This function calls go with additional argument 0, which intuitively represents a previous, argument, previous element. Go takes int and a list of int and returns a list of int. If we apply go n to an empty list, it returns an empty list. If we apply go n to x cons xs, it outputs x minus n and recurses over x and xs. Here we have some observation about invertibility of subs. First of all, subs itself is invertible. Actually, we can recover the original input from this result by using accumulative summation. For example, some of this element is 1, and some of these two elements is 2, some of these three elements is 5, and so on. 
However, go. Uh, sorry. However, subs itself is subs does not consist only of invertible functions. In fact, Go is not invertible but partially invertible. Specifically, Go n becomes invertible for any fixed or static n. This means that we need to care about partial invertibility in programming Go. This example also illustrates a challenge in partial invertible programming that is dynamic data flow into a static position. Here we highlight the, the dynamic part with blue. Here x, which is dynamic, flows into the first argument go, which is static. Because that go becomes invertible after fixing its first argument. To overcome the situation, we propose a Sparkle, a language for partially invertible computation. Sparkle comes with linear types and invertible types. Invertible types, denoted by A sub superscript R, intuitively means A types values that has to be handled only in invertible ways. Thanks to invertible types, invertible functions are represented as ordinary linear functions between invertible types in Sparkle like this. This representation provides a unified framework for describing invertible and partially invertible functions. For example, here we show the types of subs and go in Sparkle. Because that subs is a uh, subs is an invertible function. In Sparkle, subs take invertible list of int and returns an invertible list of int. Because that Go is a partially invertible function, which becomes invertible after fixing its first argument. In Sparkle, Go takes ordinary int and a list an invertible list of int and returns an invertible list of int. Sparkle also provides a pin operator to bridge the invertible and ordinary bars. By using pin operator, we can convert invertible values into ordinary values locally in this continuation. Recall that it sometimes happens that dynamic data flow into static position, which is a challenge in partially invertible programming. This pin operator is a remedy for this situation. Let us start with a very simple example to explain programming basics in Sparkle. Sparkle is a linear type higher than function programming language. Only the special thing is that it has invertible types. Here we explain how we handle values of invertible types. Here is a partially invertible addition written in Sparkle. This definition is very similar to the standard unidirectional version. But here, a function takes ordinary natural number and invertible natural number and returns an invertible natural number to highlight its partial invertibility. To construct, to construct invertible natural number, instead of using ordinary constructors, we use lifted constructors such as S superscript R. Here, we show the partially invertible multiplication defined in Sparkle. Multiplication, the similarly to the sub add function, takes natural numbers and invertible natural numbers and returns invertible natural numbers. Unlike this, uh, the add function, the map function uses uh, case analysis on invertible natural numbers. To do so, it uses invertible branching indicated by invertible patterns like Z superscript R and SY superscript R. A special thing in invertible branching is a branch comes with a width condition. These width conditions are used in backward direction to determine branches but we do not describe the details in this talk. 
Now we are ready to show how we program subsystems back off. Recall that subsystems is a function that computes differences of adjacent elements in a list. For comparison, we also show the standard unidirectional definition of subs in Haskell. The definition of the two programs look very similar, except the use of in, uh, constructs that care about impartability. Subs in Sparkle take an invertible list of int and return the invertible list of int. Surprisingly, the right-hand side of the Sparkle version of subs is identical to the unidirectional version. The goal in Sparkle takes ordinary int and invertible list of int and returns invertible list of int. To manipulate, over, man, to manipulate invertible list of int, the goal function uses lifted constructors and invertible branching. The most important part in the definition is that it uses the pin operator. By using the pin operator, we convert x of type invertible int into z of type ordinary int. Thanks to this conversion, we can call go for z and xs. Recall that the first argument of go expects int instead of invertible int. We say again that two programs have looked very similar. Indeed, they have the same recursion structure. This is a strength in Sparkle compared with existing reversible languages. Once we have defined invertible functions, we can use them by using the forward and backward functions. Here, forward is a function that runs our invertible function in the forward direction and backward that the opposite. For example, if we apply forward subs to this list, we obtain this result. And if we apply backward subs to this list, we obtain the original list again. Indeed, a pair of forward subs and backward subs form the bijection. This is fast vacuum guarantees. This is a brief introduction of Sparkle, but in our paper we, <coughs> we discuss more things. For example, we define a core system lambda pi arrow of Sparkle. Lambda pi arrow is based on a linear calculus lambda q arrow, which is a for a system of linear Haskell. The design of Lambda PI Arrow is also inspired by two stages languages. We show some formal properties about Lambda PI Arrow, including type safety and bijectivity. We also discuss larger examples, including Hoffman encoding and calculation and development of tree rebuilding from in order and pre order traversals. Let us discuss some of related work. There are some existing results concerning partial invertibility. In program transformation, there is an inversion method called partial inversion and semi inversion. Also, there are some reverse programming languages that support a limited form of partial invertibility. The design of Sparkle is inspired by our previous work, Hobbit. Hobbit is a higher order bijection programming language in which lenses are represented as ordinary functions. More specifically, lens between S and T is represented as an ordinary function between BS and BT. Here, BS and BT are very similar to invertible types in Sparkle. But Hobbit does not use linear types and it does not provide the pin operators which is very useful in partially invertible programming. Let us conclude our talk. We designed Sparkle, a programming language for writing invertible functions through composing partially invertible functions, because partially invertible functions are more natural and more expressive. Sparkle uses linear types, which is the key to correctness by construction. Thank you. Thanks, Kazutaka. 
In either time band, you should see a Q&A link appear in Clouder that brings you to a video chat where you can ask Kazutaka your questions. Welcome back for a talk by Emery Fromherz on concurrent separation logic in the F-star programming language. Hi, I'm Emerick, and it's my pleasure to be here today to present our work on SteelCore, an extensible concurrent separation logic for effectful dependent programs. Our goal in this work is to verify concurrent programs. And there has been lots of recent work in this community on this topic, especially on using concurrent separation logic for verification. One of our main success stories is the IRIS project, which provides a comprehensive, expressive logic to reason about concurrent programs. But unfortunately, it only applies to deeply embedded, simply typed languages. And we really do enjoy dependent types. We really do enjoy, for instance, their use in type theory based proof assistance, which allow us to combine modular reasoning with strong abstractions and strong specifications. So, one question we asked ourselves is, how could we get a concurrent separation logic for a dependent type language? Could, for instance, a shadow embedding work? But it comes with several challenges. The first one is, how do we actually reflect the effect of concurrency in our dependent type language? The second is, how do we support partial correctness, which is needed when reasoning about programs that might have deadlocks and that might not terminate? And lastly, Iris provides this very convenient feature to reason about concurrent programs called dynamically allocated invariance. How do we support these things in a dependent type language? And I'll come back to that a bit later. To verify concurrent programs, we've been developing a framework called STEEL, which is a concurrent separation logic DSL for F star, an effectful dependent type language designed for verification. And in this talk, I'm going to talk especially about STEEL core, which consists of the core semantics and program logic of the STEEL framework. So at the very bottom of STEEL core, we have a model of computations using action trees. And these action trees are parameterized by a state type class, which abstracts memory as well as the structure of a separation logic. And for these action trees, we provide an intrinsically typed definitional interpreter. And one of the interesting things about having it intrinsically typed here is that this allows us to reasonably to prove the soundness of our semantics without having to rely on explicit execution traces. We then instantiate this type type class with a rich concurrent separation logic that we're going to talk about more in detail later. And that provides the basis for our program logic in Steel. And finally, on top of that, on top of this program logic, we can implement dependency typed verified libraries. Let's have a look at how these different components work, starting with our core semantics. The first step is to define our state type class. What this type class contains is first a type for memory, and second, a type for separation logic assertions, SLProp, as well as operators which form a commutative monoid structure over SLProps. And lastly, we need to define a way to interpret the separation logic assertion in a given memory, that is, to decide whether the separation logic assertion holds or not in a given memory, which is this inter function. Once this is done, we can encode computations as action trees parameterized by our state type class. These action trees are indexed by three things. First, a return type, A, which is the type of values returned by the computation. Second, a precondition pre, as an SL prop. And lastly, a postcondition post, which is a separation logic assertion dependent on the value returned by the computation. We can then encode computations in a way that is reminiscent of three monads. First, we have two standard nodes, write, which returns a value, and act, which corresponds to atomic actions seen as computations. We can then define composition of two computations as a node bind. And notice here how the indices of the computations capture the standard rule of separation logic. The postcondition Q of the first computation actually corresponds to the precondition of the second computation. And another very interesting thing here is to look at the type of this continuation of the second computation. You can see here this DV effect which is a primitive effect in F star for divergence. What this means is that in this composition, we are actually encoding possibly divergent, possibly non-terminating computations. Lastly, we can define a node par for structured parallelism. The par rule is standard in concurrent separation logic. And observe again how the indices of our computations capture this classic rule. 
Assuming that the preconditions P and P' prime of the two computations are disjoint or can be styled with each other, then we can safely execute the two computations in parallel, finally returning the star of their postconditions Q and Q'. Prime. Building upon these action trees, we implement an intrinsically tight definitional interpreter that non-deterministically interleaves atomic actions. This interpreter, run, has the computation type NST. NST corresponds to non-deterministic, stateful, possibly divergent computations. And what's interesting here is that the type of the interpreter encapsulates the soundness statement about those semantics. If we initially have the validity of a precondition P in our initial memory M, then after execution, we do have that the postcondition Q is valid in the final memory F M1. And here, all of this is done in a partial correctness setting because NST can model possibly divergent computations. Now that we have a generic semantics, we need to instantiate our state type class to provide a program logic. The first step is to instantiate the memory type. And for this, we're going to remain standard and consider memory to be a map from abstract addresses to type references. We can then instantiate our separation logic. And the first step is to provide standard separation logic connectives such as star, magic quant, conjunction, quantification, and so on. But we're also providing points to assertions, which are indexed by partial commutative monoids. Partial commutative monoids have been studied extensively in the literature and used to encode a variety of things, such as, for instance, sharing disciplines. And lastly, we're also going to provide dynamically allocated invariants associated to separation logic assertions. And that's what I will present next. We will consider named invariants, where the name will be encoded as a natural number. And we will also have this proposition, which is here, this squibby arrow, which states that a specific name is associated to one specific separation logic assertion P. And so instead, a named invariant is going to be this association of a name with this refinement that its name is actually associated to one specific separation logic assertion. And what's interesting here is that these invariants are just values. And as such, they are freely duplicable and they can be shared easily between threads. Now, to dynamically allocate invariants in steel, we provide this function new invariant, which takes as an argument a separation logic assertion P. This function has the computation type steel, which reflects the computation that we encoded as action trees. You can see here that the indices of the steel effect correspond to the indices of our action trees. The first index is the type returned by the computation, which is here an invariant associated to P. And it has as a precondition that initially we need ownership, we need the validity of the separation logic assertion P. After execution of the function and creation of the invariant, we do not have access to this resource anymore. It has been successfully locked away behind the invariant. Implementing this function was one of the main technical difficulties in Steel. The code is actually fairly involved and relies on things like a monotonic state. If you're interested, I invite you to go read the paper. Now that we defined invariants in Steel, how do we actually use them? The core idea of an invariant is that it has to hold at all times. And because of that, only atomic commands can access invariants as long as I restore them after execution. So what is an atomic command in steel? Well, first, all atomic actions are atomic commands. But their possible composition with ghost computations is also considered to be an atomic command because these ghost computations are computationally irrelevant. They will not be actually executed and hence they can safely be considered atomic. And to separate atomic computations from regular steel programs, we define a new effect, steel atomic, as a sub-effect of the steel effect. And you can see it has many similarities with the steel effect. It still has a return type A, as well as a precondition P and a postcondition Q. But it also has this additional index is ghost, which indicates whether the computation is ghost or not, and allows safe composition of atomic commands. It also has an additional index that we omit for now. Now that we have this effect, we can define an invariant handler which takes as argument an invariant i associated to an SSL prop p and a function f. And what this handler says is that if f is an atomic function which accesses p but also restores it after execution, then we can safely 
open the invariant, execute f, and then close the invariant again. And because of that, we can give a signature that does not involve p in its specification anymore. In practice, the last index of the state matter effect I was mentioning is a set of currently opened invariants. And the reason is that even though invariants are duplicable, the separation logic assertions that they protect might not be. So opening an invariant several times might actually lead to unsoundness. And so that's what steel core consists of. We provided two effects, steel and steel atomic, which reflect the effect of concurrency as defined by our semantics in F star. And then on top of this, we instantiated a program logic with a memory and a rich concurrent separation logic containing standard connectives, as well as a PCM-based memory model and invariants. And we also provide a variety of actions, such as, for instance, an atomic compare and swap, which allows us to operate on memory. Now, we can actually use the Steel framework to implement verified dependently typed libraries, such as, for instance, a library for SpinLock. And there is no reason to stop here. On top of SpinLock, we can use the SpinLock interface to implement new libraries, such as, for instance, a library for fork join operations or a library for channel types. Channel types are a lightweight version of session types. The idea is that to each channel, we're going to associate one protocol P. And we are also going to provide two separation logic assertions, sender and receiver, to reason about these channels. Using these separation logic assertions, we can then specify and implement a send function, which will take as argument a channel C associated to a protocol P, as well as a message X, which is compatible with the current state of a protocol. And so what the signature of this function states is that if we initially have send permission on this channel C, and the channel is currently at a stage where cur remains to be executed, then we can indeed send this message, and we then get a permission, a send permission on this channel where the protocol advanced one step after executing X. And so we can define the dual version of this, which would be a receive function. Using this library, we can now specify and implement dependently typed protocols, such as, for instance, this simple ping pong protocol. What this protocol says is that we are first expected to send an integer on a channel, and we're then going to receive a new integer, which is ensured to be strictly greater than the one we sent. So this is the specification of our protocol. And we can now implement a client version of this protocol that takes as argument a channel which is ensured to follow a ping pong protocol. So we first send a message on the channel, which we here pick to be 17. We then receive a new integer, and since the channel is expected to follow the protocol, we can prove that this integer is actually strictly greater than the one we sent, which here is 17. And what's really interesting is that all of this verification is done here statically by virtue of type checking. If we are, for instance, to start our client implementation by trying to receive a message, verification would fail because the protocol states that the first action has to be a send. To conclude in this talk, I presented the core semantics and program logic of Steel, the shallow embedding of concurrent separation logic in F star, a dependent type language. The Steel program logic has a memory model which is based on partial commutative monoids, and it also enables concurrency reasoning through dynamically allocated invariants. All of our development is mechanized in about 11,000 lines of code in F star, and it comes with a stack of verified libraries which is growing every day. Our hope with the Steel framework is really to provide a full-fledged dependent type programming language, which would be useful for verified, concurrent, and distributed programming. All of this being built on top of a low-level memory model and with an extensible program logic which is expressed in and embedded within F star. During this talk, there are many details of our work that I didn't mention. First of all, our semantics are actually much more complicated to enable support for also reasoning in a style akin to implicit dynamic frames on top of separation logic. Second, we also allow reasoning on references using monotonicity and pre-orders. And lastly, we provide several more libraries. First of all, we provide the spin logs and fork join libraries that I mentioned. And we also model log coupling lists as well as counters with local states using closures over SL props for the latter. If you're interested by any of these things, I invite you to go read the paper. Thank you for your attention.
Thanks, Amaric. In either time band, you should see a Q&A link appear in Clouder, taking you to a video chat with at least one of the authors of this paper. Okay, let's jump into a talk by Mohsen Lesani on compositional verification of distributed systems. Good morning. I'm going to talk about TLC, Temporal Logic of Distributed Components. I am Mohsen Lesani, an assistant professor at the University of California, Riverside. My student Jeremiah Griffin, that is actively working on the Koch framework, is present in the conference. The other students that helped me are Narges Shadab and Shija Yin. Distributed systems are critical to reliable and scalable computing. However, they are complicated and prone to bugs. To manage this complexity, network middleware has been traditionally built in layered stacks of components. The state of the art for verification of distributed systems does not consider either compositional reasoning, program logics, or liveness properties. We present TLC, a novel program logic for compositional verification of both safety and liveness properties of distributed system stacks. This project includes a layered and functional programming model to capture distributed components, a temporal assertion language to specify both safety and liveness properties, compositional verification of distributed stacks, a novel program logic that supports intuitive reasoning steps, and an operational semantics for distributed stacks and the soundness of the logic. We successfully applied it to compose and verify stacks of fundamental distributed components. The ultimate goal is to build certified distributed middleware, and towards this goal, we are mechanizing our proofs in car. We present a layered programming model to capture functional implementations of distributed components. A component receives incoming requests from the parent component and incoming indications from the subcomponents. It defines two handler function functions request and indication for these events. It also defines a handler that is periodically called. These handlers return a triple, the new internal state of the component and the list of issued outgoing requests to subcomponents and outgoing indications to the parent component. Let us consider the perfect link component that uses a stubborn link subcomponent. We abbreviate their names as PL and SL. SL repeatedly resends messages so that they are eventually delivered. This results in multiple deliveries. Therefore, PL is built on the top of SL to eliminate duplicate messages. The state of each node stores counter, the number of messages sent by the current node, and also received, the set of received message identifiers. Each message is uniquely identified by the pair of the sender node identifier and the number of the messages in that node. Upon a, a request to send a message, the counter is incremented and the message is sent together with the new counter value using DSL subcomponent. Upon a delivery indication of a message from DSL subcomponent, if the message is already received, it is ignored. Otherwise, the message identifier is added to the received set and a PL delivery indication event is issued. Here we briefly illustrate the propagation of events across the stack. We have a stack of components on the left and a trace of events on the right with events at different levels. A request at the top level results in a request for the left subcomponent that in turn results in a request for its own subcomponent that results in an indication and another indication up and finally an indication at the top level. In the next slides, we will use the indication identifier D of an event that is the reverse list of branch indices from the top component to that event. We now take a look at parts of the assertion language. We use the classical operators always and always in the past, and eventually and eventually in the past. The assertion A strongly implies A prime is syntactic sugar for always A implies A prime. The assertion A leads to A prime is syntactic sugar for always A 
implies eventually a prime. Similarly, the assertion a preceded by a prime is syntactic sugar for always a implies eventually in the past a prime. The flexible variables for the elements of an event are the identifier n of the node that executes the event, the location identifier d in the stack that the event is executed at, the output requests ORS, and output indications OIS that the event issues, and the pre-state S and the post-state S prime of the event. We use the syntactic sugar assertion self to describe events that are applied to the top component. Now, two important syntactic sugar. Here, down arrow denotes a request, and up arrow denotes an indication. This syntactic sugar describes an event at node n at the top level location t where the request event send and prime and m is executed. The bullet is just a separator. And this second syntactic sugar describes an event at node n at the child location 1 where the indication event deliver and prime and m is executed. The specification of both safety and liveness properties of the perfect link can be written almost verbatim from their natural language descriptions. Let's see reliable delivery as a liveness property. If a correct node n sends a message m to a correct node n prime, then n prime will eventually deliver m. A no forge property as a safety property. If a node n delivers a message m with sender n prime, then n prime has previously sent m to n. And a similar no forge property is stated for stubborn links. Let us consider compositional verification. We have two stacks S0 and S1 with the specifications I0 and I1. To implement a new component C, we use them as subcomponents. We want to verify the specification A for C based on only the specifications and not the implementations of the subcomponents. A fundamental question is how the specification of a component should be lowered to be used as a subcomponent. Lowering is not possible for every assertion. We observe that lowering specifications require certain information such as the location of events to be present and certain operators such as next to be absent from the specification. We identify the subset of the assertion language that is both restrictive enough to allow the definition of the lowering transformation and expressive enough to represent specifications. The lower function first pushes and then restricts the, re the assertion. We visit each one of these two functions in turn. When a component is used as a subcomponent, its events appear at a deeper level. For example, the location of the events of the first component are at the top level shown by the empty path. But when the component is used as the first subcomponent, the events appear at branch 0, written as the path 0. The push transformation pushes the locations under branch i. The important case is the atom case. The location d is explicit in the atom. Appending i to the location d effectively pushes the events to branch i. Next, the restrict function. When a stack is at the top, all events belong to that stack. However, when it is pushed to a substack, it's not alone anymore. Its events are interleaved with the events from the sibling substacks and the top component. The restrict transformation restricts the specification to remain valid on traces that are extended with interleaving events. The important case is always A. After pushing, the assertion always A does not necessarily remain valid. It remains valid on only the events under that branch. Therefore, the restricting condition of being under branch I is added. Let us take a look at a few basic and derived inference rules of the TLC program logic. The basic inference rules capture the fundamental reasoning steps and fit in half a page yet they provide the basis for the derived rules and verification of full stacks. Here we consider two basic rules and one derived rule. 
The judgments of this form states that under the assumed assertions gamma, the assertion A holds for the component C. The rule OI for output indication states that if at a node N an output indication E is issued by a self-event, then eventually at N and the top level T, the indication event E is executed. The rule OI prime states this relation in the opposite direction. If at a node N and the top level T, an output indication event E is executed, then in the past at that node N, the indication event E should have been issued by a self-event. Let us now look at the derived rule in VEL. This rule reduces a global tempor temporal invariant for the component to non-temporal and local proof obligations for its handler functions. It states that if a non-temporal assertion A holds for all the three handler functions of the component, request, indication, and periodic, then the assertion holds in every self-event. Thus, the functional implementation of the component can be used to derive invariants. We showcase TLC with the example proof of the no-force property for PL. If a PL delivery event is executed, it is preceded by its corresponding PL send event. Starting from the PL delivery event, the first step states that if a PL delivery event is executed, the event should have been previously issued. Then the step two shows that if a PL delivery event is issued, it is issued by an SL deliver event. And step three uses the lowered specification of the no forge property of the SL subcomponent. Every SL deliver event is preceded by an SL send event. And the other steps are similar. By transitivity of precedence, we get the no-forge property for PL. These steps can be captured in TLC. Here we look at step 2. We want to prove that if a PL deliver event is issued, the issuing event is an SL deliver event. To prove it, we use the rule in L that we saw before with this assertion as A that states that a PL deliver event is issued by only an SL deliver event and the definition of the component as C. The first obligation is for the request handler. The request function issues an empty set of output indications. And so the assertion A trivially holds. The next obligation is for the indication handler. It issues a PL deliver event, but that is when an SL deliver event is processed. So the assertion A holds. And finally, the obligation for the periodic handler trivially holds in this component. This results in this assertion that with a simple rearrangement is equivalent to the assertion in step two. We define the operational semantics of distributed stacks. It models the propagation of events across the stack, message passing across nodes in partially synchronous networks, and crash stop failures. We prove the soundness of TLC. TLC derives only valid assumptions from valid assumptions. We also prove the soundness of lowering. If an invariant is valid for a stack SI, and SI is a substack of a stack S, then the lowered invariant is valid for S as well. We successfully applied this approach to a stack, stack of fundamental distributed components, including stubborn links, perfect links, best effort broadcast, uniform reliable broadcast, and epoch paxos consensus. And towards the goal of certified middleware, we are mechanizing our proofs in a CARC framework. I invite you to read the paper, and I will be glad to answer your questions. Time band, you should now see a link appear in Clouder to join the video Q&A with Mosin.
To close out the session, we have Ning Ning Shi presenting a variant of algebraic effects that admits efficient implementation. Hello, everyone. I'm Ning Ning. I'm going to present our work, Effect Handlers, Evidently. Hello, everyone. In this work, we show that we can elaborate algebraic effects by evidence passing to polymorphic lambda calculus. This gives new semantics of algebraic effects. In particular, there is no need for a special runtime system for implementations. This can be extremely useful if you want to compile algebraic effects to languages like C. Moreover, we show that with evidence passing, such an implementation can be quite efficient. Before we go to the technical details, let's start with an overview of algebraic effects. Algebraic effects and the extension with handlers are a powerful way to incorporate effects in programming languages. To understand how it works, we start with a typical example of the reader effect. On the left-hand side, we define a simple effect, reader, which has a single operation, ask. The type of ask says that you can call ask by providing a unit argument, it will then return you an integer. Now we can already start using ask. The expression below simply calls ask twice and returns the sum. However, we still don't know how it would evaluate. The semantics of effects is given by effect handlers, where handlers provide operation implementations. We handle an expression by wrapping it in a lambda which takes a unit. In our example, we use x to denote the operation argument, in this case, unit. The extra argument k is implicitly provided by the system, which denotes the resumption, that is, how to resume the computation when an operation is performed. In this case, we always resume with 1. When the first ask is performed, the handler returns 1, and we have 1 plus perform ask unit. Then the second ask is performed, and we have 1 plus 1, which gives the result 2. One remarkable feature of algebraic effects is the decoupling of effects and the implementation of effects. In particular, we can use the same handler to handle a different computation, or we can easily use a different handler to handle the same computation. In summary, algebraic effects provide a useful way to encode composable and modular computational effects by having effects which define a family of operations separately from handlers which give semantics to operations. We have seen the example of reader, and we refer to our paper for more complicated examples. However, it is non-trivial to support algebraic effects in real-world programming languages. We demonstrated the issue with this example. This code has three handlers, followed by an expression which simply calls ask twice, as we have seen before. The three handlers are a reader handler, an ink handler, which increases the computation result by 1, and an exception handler, which returns a default value 3 if the computation fails. As before, since the reader always returns 1, we expect the answer to be 2. Now, let's take a closer look at how this expression evaluates. We first evaluate the reader handler. Now, we need to remember that we have a reader handler available in the evaluation context, since later we may need to use the handler to handle certain operations. In a similar way, we evaluate the ink handler and the exception handler. We then hit the first ask, but we don't know how to handle it. Thus, we yield up to the evaluation context and hope to find a reader handler. The innermost handler is an exception handler, which is not useful in this case. We keep going up and find an ink handler, which is again not useful in this case. Finally, we reach a reader handler, which says that we should always resume with integer 1. Now we need to resume and go back to where the operation is handled. And this is where we hit the second ask. Now we need to repeat the whole process again by first yielding up and then resuming. As you may have noticed, implementing algebraic effects this way requires special runtime support to yield up to capture the resumption and to resume. 
This is very difficult to add to existing programming languages. Moreover, it is very inefficient. To support two asks, we have yielded up and resumed twice. It can be more time consuming if the handler stack is even larger. Hence, the goal of our work is to have composable, modular, efficient, and easy to implement computational effects. To this end, we present new semantics of algebraic effects in terms of polymorphic lambda calculus by first introducing an intermediate evidence calculus. We can then elaborate polymorphic algebraic effects via evidence passing translation to the evidence calculus. This turns out to be surprisingly tricky to get right. In particular, the coherence of evidence translation turns out to only be preserved under scoped resumptions. Finally, we define a monadic multi-prompt translation from the evidence calculus to the polymorphic lambda calculus. Combining these two translations, we get an implementation of algebraic effects upon plain polymorphic lambda calculus and thus requires no special runtime support. We have proved awesomeness and coherence of the translation. It also turns out that doing evidence translation does not only get rid of special runtime system, but also allows us to implement algebraic effects more efficiently, especially for tail resumptive operations. In the rest of the talk, we first go through the meaning of the scoped resumptions and then discuss these two translations. To understand the restriction of scoped resumptions, let's consider this example. Here we have two handlers, h1 and h evil, that represent the expression E. The whole result is then given to F. The definition of E performs three operations, ask, evil, and ask. The handler h1 is a reader handler, which handles ask by always resuming with one. A reasonable expectation now is that these two asks in E would both return 1. However, we show that while the first ask, as expected, gives back 1, the second ask gives back a different number 2. How is that possible? We define the evil handler in a way that instead of resuming, it directly returns the resumption k. If then gets the resumption, and applies the resumption under a different handler h2, which handles ask by returning 2 instead. Note in this example, k is captured under a handler context with h1 and is resumed under a different handler with h2. This is very powerful, perhaps too powerful, as it can interfere with the ability to reason about the program. We define the notion of scoped resumptions as a restriction of general effect handlers, where resumptions can only be applied in the very scope of their original handler context. Thus, the previous example is rejected under scoped resumptions. We believe all important effect handlers can be written with scoped resumptions, including complicated examples like async or concurrent scheduling. The previous example can also be rewritten to pass the restriction. In this work, we focus on the evidence translation and use a dynamic check in our formalism. In the paper, we also show several designs on how to check this property statically. Using scoped resumptions, we define the evidence passing translation. The key idea of evidence passing is that a vector of handlers is passed down as an implicit parameter, similar to the dictionary translation in Haskell for type classes. To understand how evidence passing works, we re-evaluate the previous example using the evidence passing semantics. As before, we first evaluate the reader handler. This time, we create a fresh unique marker represented as M1 to denote this particular reader handler. We call the pair of the marker and the handler an evidence, and we pass the evidence down as we re-evaluate. We then evaluate the ink handler by creating another fresh unique marker M2 and pass the new evidence along with the existing reader evidence. That is, we now have an evidence vector. We denote an evidence vector using the letter W. 
We do the same for the exception handler and get one more evidence. Now we hit the first ask operation. This time, we first inspect the evidence vector. From the evidence vector, we find the reader handler that is supposed to handle this operation has marker M1. We can then yield up, but in this case, finding the correct handler can be much faster than before because we only need to compare the markers. Actually, the evaluation can be even faster. That is, we don't need to yield up at all. Because from the evidence vector, we do not only know the marker of the handler, but we have the handler itself available. From the handler implementation, we know that the reader handler has a tail receptive implementation. Therefore, we can evaluate the handler in place and get a result 1 as the result of ask, and keep evaluating. We can then hit the second ask and get an other one. Compared to the previous evaluation, this time the evaluation is a straight line, which means that it does not change the control flow at all. This is thus much more efficient than the previous one. To make such evaluation strategies possible, we have proved the following theorem. The theorem essentially states that when performing an operation of effect L, the handler we find in the evidence vector W, which is W.L, is exactly the innermost handler for that operation in the dynamic evaluation context, which is MH. Thus, with evidence passing, we significantly improved the efficiency of algebraic effects. In particular, here resumptive operations can evaluate in place. This optimization enables truly efficient effect operations at a cost similar to a virtual method call. non tail resumptive operations still need to yield up, but from the evidence vector, we can locally decide which marker to yield to, which is still more efficient than finding the handler dynamically. Hello, everyone. Based upon evidence passing, we can then implement handlers using multi-prompt delimited continuations. Specifically, given evidence MH, we can directly yield to a specific prompt N. Moreover, since the evidence provided the handler implementation directly, it is no longer needed in the context. Such translation is very important, as it provides the missing link between traditional implementations based on dynamic search for the handlers and implementations of lexical effect handlers using multi-prompt delimited control. Specifically, we define a multi-prompt translation from the evidence language into standard polymorphic lambda calculus, where the monad implements the multi-prompt semantics. Now, no special runtime system is needed anymore, and we can generate code directly for languages like C or WebAssembly. Moreover, with a standard backend, advanced compilation strategies can be used, for example, compilation-guided reference counting. Hello, everyone. We summarize all calculi and meta theory in our paper using this figure. We have a polymorphic algebraic effect calculus, system FE. We can erase the types in system FE and get to an untyped algebraic effect calculus, system lambda E. Also, we can do an evidence passing translation to a polymorphic evidence calculus, system FEV. Finally, we show that system FEV can use the multi-prompt translation and translate to a polymorphic lambda calculus, system FV. With both translations available, we get an implementation of polymorphic algebraic effects in terms of polymorphic lambda calculus. Hello, everyone. Please read our paper for more details. Moreover, we have provided an implementation of the evidence passing translation in the COCA programming language, and initial benchmark results are very promising. Finally, we present a Haskell library of effect handlers based on the technical described here. We encourage interested people to read our Haskell paper or watch the talk for more details. That's all. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Ning Ning. In either time band, you should see a Q&A link appear in Clouder, which you can click to video chat with at least one of the authors of this paper. And that's it for this session. Before or after chatting with the authors of that last paper, 
please take advantage of our coffee break to, for instance, create your own ad hoc video chat room or join one that you already see there. We really want to simulate what's great about the ICFP social experience in the hallways, so don't be shy. We'll also have some more structured social activities right after the coffee break, as well as throughout the rest of the three days of the main conference. And we'll be back here for the next technical session at 2.30 p.m. New York time.